Hi everybody and thank you for joining us. My name is Rebecca Picasso. I'm the Program Director for the California Telehealth Resource Center. Today we're going to talk about telehealth reimbursement during COVID-19 specific to FQHC and RHC billing. So a little note here that reimbursement information is constantly changing during the public health emergency. The information contained in this slide deck is current as of May 1st at 5 p.m. Please check with your local, state, and federal health plan pages for the most current and up-to-date information. So let's dive right in and talk about Medicare. So traditionally, Medicare has five criteria for telehealth reimbursement. The first being that the patient was seen from an eligible originating site location as defined by CMS, um, and that the originating site location must be located in a rural area. Um, those uh, criteria have been waived during the public health emergency. So the patient's home is now an eligible originating site, and it can be in an urban or rural location. The next is that the encounter was performed at a distant site by an eligible practitioner. Um, so this list of eligible practitioners is absolutely still valid. However, on April 30th, CMS added physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech language pathologists for the duration of the public health emergency. Traditionally, RHCs and FQHCs could not provide services as a distant site for Medicare for telehealth. Um, however, with the passage of the CARES Act, for the duration of the public health emergencies, FQHCs and RHCs can act as a distant site. Uh, the next is that the patient must be present and the encounter must involve interactive audio and video telecommunications. And recently, uh, CMS came out uh, with guidance that services can be audio only for the duration of the public health emergency. The type of service provided must fall within the Medicare eligible services table. And while that table absolutely has not changed, uh, CMS added 80 additional codes to the list of eligible telehealth services. So now there's about 200 or so, I believe. Um, and you can see all of those codes at the link there on the screen. A quick note here about the originating site fee. The home is not eligible for an originating site fee. So what does that mean? That means that if your patient is physically present in your clinic and receiving telehealth services on site, then you can still bill for a Q3014. However, if the patient is in their home and your FQHC provider is seeing them via video or telephone, you cannot bill the Q code. Um, I do get a lot of questions on that, so hopefully that clears it up a little bit. So what do we know about FQHC and RHC billing as a distant site for Medicare? Um, CMS originally released an MLN on April 17th detailing payment for FQHCs and RHCs during the public health emergency. On April 30th, CMS updated the previously mentioned MLN and changed how they are asking you to bill uh, quite significantly. So. FQHCs and RHCs will not be paid their PPS or air rate for telehealth services. That hasn't changed. Instead, they will still be paid $92.03 per visit. Um, distant site services can be furnished by any healthcare practitioner working for the clinic within the scope of practice. The practitioners can furnish the telehealth services from any distant site location, including their own home, during the time that they are working for the RHC or FQHC. Um, just a quick note here that they don't have to register their home as um, their practice location or office location with CMS during the public health emergency. Um, effective March 6th, patients may be at any site, including their home. And so let's talk about some claims detail. For claims January 27th, 2020 through June 30th, 2020, clinics will be paid their PPS or air rate. And I know what you're thinking. I just told you they're not going to get your, your PPS or air rate. However, um, what's going to happen is CMS will reprocess claims um, that were sent through with dates of service January 27th through June 30th. They will reprocess these claims in July and will adjust these payments back to $93.02. So what does this mean? This means that if a clinic has a PPS or an air rate that is less than $92, Medicare will pay you the difference um, between what your PPS rate is and $92.03 for those services between January 27th and June 30th. 
However, if your PPS is more than $92.03, Medicare will recoup an amount equal to the number of telehealth visits that you conducted. So what does that look like? Here's an example. Let's say your PPS or air rate is $200. Between January 27th and June 30th, 2020, your clinic provided 450 telehealth visits. Your clinic was entitled to $92.03 for each visit. However, you were paid your $200 PPS or air rate. So CMS is gonna recoup $38,869.20 from your clinic in July. How did we come to that number? So we took your $200 PPS rate, we subtracted $92.03, that left you with an overpayment of $107.97. We multiplied that by 450 visits, which gave us $48,586.50. Multiply that by 80%, which is what CMS pays, and we come to $38,869.20. So here's what the new MLN is asking you guys to do. They've, we've separated out here between RHCs and FQHCs. So the first thing we're going to talk about billing-wise for Medicare is RHCs. So for services furnished from January 27th through June 30th, they want you to bill using HCPCS code G2025 you have to append modifier CG and modifier 95 is optional and the place of service is going to be equivalent to where the service would have been rendered in person. So uh, CMS gave you a nice little pictorial there. So for these visits, January 27th through June 30th, revenue code is going to be 0521 probably, 02 whatever it is that you would normally build with your revenue code. Your HCPCS code is going to be G2025. Modifier CG is required. Modifier 95 is optional. Um, for RHCs, um, for services starting on July 1 through the end of the public health emergency, you are going to bill with HCPCS code G2025, no CG modifier, and modifier 95 is optional. For FQs, it's a little bit more involved. <laughs> so for qualifying visits done via telehealth, um, from January 27th through June 30th, you are going to bill using your PPS specific HCPCS code. So the those G codes, G04666, 6768, or 70. And a HCPCS or CPT code that describes the service that you did with a modifier 95 and a G2025 with modifier 95. Your place of service is gonna be equivalent to where the service would have been rendered in person. So again, looking at the little pictorial here, um, your HCPCS codes, there's going to be three. It's going to be, uh, for example, a G0467, a 99214, and a G2025. That 99214 and that G2025 are both going to have modifier 95 appended to them. If you are furnishing services um, via telehealth that are not FQHC qualifying visits, CMS is asking you to hold those claims until July 1. They will come out with further guidance on how to bill for those. So for FQHC qualifying services um, starting on July 1 through the end of the public health emergency, just like the um, RHCs, you're going to bill with a uh, HCPCS code G2025. Modifier 95 is optional. Um, only distant site services furnished during the public health emergency are authorized for payment. Um, if the public health emergency is in effect after December 31, then the rate that they pay you is going to be adjusted based on the 2021 physician fee schedule. Um, so there may be a little bit of an increase there. Since telehealth distance site services are not paid under an RHC um, air or FQHC PPS rate, your Medicare Advantage plan wraparound payment does not apply. Um, and so any wraparound payments for distance site telehealth services will be adjusted by your Medicare Advantage plans. Audio only billing. So effective March 1, RHCs and FQHCs can furnish and bill for audio only telephone EM services. You're going to bill those using the HCPCS code G2025. To bill for these services, services, you must spend at least five minutes of telephone providing an ENM service by a physician or other qualified healthcare professional who can report an ENM service, and it must be provided to an established patient, parent, or guardian. 
These services cannot be billed if they originate from an E&M service provided within the previous seven days or lead to an E&M service or procedure within the next 24 hours or soonest available appointment. So retroactive to March uh, 18th, 2020, CMS is going to pay for all of the costs associated with testing and treatment of COVID-19. Um, and this is ap applicable to telehealth services. Uh, you must waive the uh, collection of coinsurance from beneficiaries. You have the option to waive cost sharing for all tele excuse me, for all telehealth services should you choose to, but for COVID-19 testing, you absolutely have to. So for all visits and services in which the coinsurance is waived, you must append modifier CS on the service line. Claims with the CS modifier will initially be paid with the coinsurance applied. However, the MAC will automatically reprocess and adjust these claims on July 1. Uh, and coinsurance should not be collected from the beneficiaries if the coinsurance is waived. So a little recap here. There's no restrictions on originating site or location of the patient at the time of the visit. Uh, an FQHC or RHC provider does not need to be physically located at the clinic. They can be in their home and they do not have to register their home office with Medicare during the emergency. The patient's home has been added as an eligible originating site effective March 6th. The patients can be located anywhere. It doesn't have to just be in an MSA or a HIPSA or non-urban. Um, so meaning they can be urban or rural. The patient can present to any eligible healthcare site. So that means a hospital, clinic, FQHC, RHC, or be located in their own home. And services absolutely can be audio only. So what other options are out there? Let's say that you're providing services that maybe are not equivalent to face-to-face -face and you're not going to be able to bill as a telehealth distance site. What other options do you have available? So Medicare has what they call virtual visits and that encompasses three main things. The first one is virtual check-ins. Virtual check-ins are billed with G0071. They are patient-initiated telephone or live video. They involve a physician or non-physician practitioner having at least a five-minute check-in with an established patient to assess whether the patient needs to come in for an office visit. So these are kind of more like triage. They're definitely not going to replace your, um, your in-person visits. Um, the practitioner may respond to the patient's concern via telephone, audio or video, I'm sorry, audio and video, secure text messaging, email, or the use of a patient portal. Um, same conditions apply here as they do for audio only. So the virtual check-in must be for a condition not related to an E&M service provided within the previous seven days and does not lead to an E&M service or procedure within the next 24 hours or soonest available appointment. There are no frequency limitations. You can use this as much as you'd like. Um, the caveat here is that there are a certain set of providers that are eligible to utilize these codes. So billable providers are physicians, NPs, PAs, CNMs, uh, CPs, and CSWs. If the, dis uh, the discussion could be conducted by a nurse or a health educator or any other clinical personnel, it's not going to be billable as a virtual visit. Place of service is equivalent to where the service would have been reported for an in-person visit. The next ones are e-visits. E-visits are also billed with code G0071. E-visits are patient-initiated digital communications via an online patient portal that requires a clinical decision that otherwise typically would have been provided in the office. So these ones can kind of more replace your face-to-face, -face, but remember that they're patient-initiated and um, they're through the use of an online patient portal. A billable provider must spend at least five minutes or more over, over the course of seven days providing E&M services. Seven days must lapse before you can bill the G0071 again. So what does that mean? That means they're cumulative for the same condition. So if a patient contacts you on a Monday about a rash on their arm, and then they contact you again on Friday about the same rash, you can only bill the G0071 one time um, in the course of seven days. However, if the patient contacts you on Monday for their rash, and on Friday they contact you for a cough, you can bill the G0071 twice because those are two separate conditions. Um, 
It does include multiple digital visits over the course of seven days if they are for related signs, symptoms, and conditions. Um, so what CMS did was they took the 99421, 422, and 433, which are fee-for-service codes, and they've combined them all together along with the payment rate, averaged it out, and plunked it into the G0071 for you. You as an FQHC or RHC are not able to bill for the uh, 99421, 22, or 23 separately, but you will bill them as a G0071. The place of service is equivalent to where the service would have been reported for in person. And the last one is remote evaluation services, aka store and forward. Also billed with a G0071. Um, they are patient initiated and consist of a practitioner evaluating a patient's transmitted information via pre-recorded video or an image. Um, the practitioner can respond to the patient's concern via telephone, audio, video, secure text messaging, email, or the use of the patient portal. The services can only be billed if the condition is not related to a service provided within the previous seven days and does not lead to a service provided within the next 24 hours or soonest available appointment. There are no frequency limitations on this one either. Billable practitioners are physicians, NPs, PAs, CNMs, CPs, and CSWs. If the discussion could be conducted by a nurse, health educator, or other clinical personnel, it's not billable as a virtual communication service. So what does that mean? How do you bill it? So um, you typically are going to bill on a UB04 claim form. Um, the RHC type of bill is going to be 711. FQHC type of bill is going to be 771. Your revenue code is going to be um, 0521. No modifier is required. And again, place of service is the same as it would have been for an in-person. And for the emergency period, effective March 1, CMS will pay $24.76. So that's that average payment between those other three codes we talked about a moment ago. Because normally these payments would be around $14. Um, consent, verbal patient consent is required for all virtual visits, so that would be the virtual check-ins, the e-visits, and the remote evaluations. Consent can be obtained at the time that the service is furnished or prior to the service being furnished during the emergency period. Consent may, <coughs> excuse me, consent may be obtained by ancillary staff under the general supervision of a provider of the RHC or FQHC. Okay, a little note about video platforms here. The Office of Civil Rights has temporarily relaxed its enforcement standards during the national emergency to allow for covered healthcare providers to use video platforms that don't fully comply with HIPAA. These have to be non-public facing um, and they can be non-HIPAA compliant. So examples would be FaceTime or Skype. Um, a public facing one would be like Facebook Live. You definitely can't use Facebook Live to see patients. Um, but you can use non-HIPAA compliant, non-public facing <clears throat> video platforms. Um, you do have to separately consent the patient for this though. You have to let them know that there may be additional privacy risks and you have to obtain consent for this. Um, and just as a, a quick note from the CTRC, using a HIPAA compliant platform is so much better than using a non-HIPAA compliant platform and takes just about as much time. And so we always recommend that wherever possible, you use a HIPAA compliant platform. CMS has some COVID-19 resource pages um, that are really chock full of quite a bit of information. Um, so the first one is the CMS Current Emergencies page. Um, that has all of their waiver information, quite a few of these new policies that they're putting out. They post quite a bit of information on there. The second one is a CMS newsroom. So anytime they put out a media release, um, that's going to be on the newsroom. So if you want to know about the new stuff that CMS is doing or putting out around telehealth or COVID-19, the newsroom is a pretty good place to check. And then the last one is my favorite. This is the CMS MLN's Connect newsletter. Um, these come out as frequently as CMS makes changes. Um, so anytime there's a change, CMS sends out an MLN Connect newsletter. So if you were to click on that link and you were to go to the bottom of the page, you'll see an image similar to the one that's on the bottom of this slide that says receive email updates. Go ahead and just type your email address in there and hit submit and you're subscribed. Um, it is definitely my one of my favorite resources. 
So let's talk um, a little bit about Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal has also made quite a few changes. Um, so on April 30th, DHCS updated their Medi-Cal payment for telehealth and virtual slash telephonic communications um, relative to COVID-19. Um, so what does that mean for you guys? FQHCs and RHCs are absolutely able to bill their PPS or air rate as applicable for live video telehealth and telephone services. Patients do not have to be HHMS to be seen in their home during the public health emergency. That's really important because otherwise FQHC and RHC services to the patient home are limited to HHMS patients. So during COVID-19, that restriction has been removed. Um, DHCS has included a handy dandy little chart that tells you which, which HCPCS codes and CPT codes and all that good stuff that you need to bill. So for any telehealth or telephonic services that are replacing in-person services, you're going to put your applicable revenue code. You're going to use HCPCS code T1015 if you're billing fee for service or T1015 SE for managed care. You're also going to put a CPT code. So you need to put the 99201 to 205 for new patients or the 99211 to 215 for established patients. Um, so that's kind of new to you guys. Um, also a quick note that if a provider is billing for behavioral health, you will actually have two CPT codes. So you'll have a HCPCS code, you'll have a CPT code that says they were either new or established, and you'll have your behavioral health code. So there will be three for those guys. Um, and then if you're providing a service that does not fall within your um, scope, your RHC services, or um, somehow just does not satisfy the criteria for full payment of your PPS, you're going to bill that with a G0071, and Medi-Cal is going to pay you $13.69. Um, so in their update to that document we were talking about a little bit ago, DHCS left this little note and I think it's really handy to have. So DHCS is aware that FQs, RHCs, and tribal health clinics do not typically include CPT codes as part of their traditional claim submission. Um, and that said, for the purposes of the public health emergency and the temporary flexibilities that they have under their policies, um, they want you to use CPT code so that they can track the services um, that were provided. And um, they also want to be able to, um, I just totally lost my train of thought, guys. I'm so sorry. That's horrible. So they want to be able to track the services that were provided by a virtual and telephonic communication. And so they're, they're requesting that you modify how you would normally bill in order to do that. They want you to put the CPT codes in the informational line of the claim form. Um, and the, the CPT codes will also allow DHCS to track the level of complexity of the patients that you're seeing and whether or not it was a new or established patient. So they dive down a little bit further. Um, so for Medi-Cal fee for service for the PPS or air rate, um, FQs would need to list their HCPCS code T1015 in the payable claim line in conjunction with one of the appropriate CPT codes for new patient or established patient on the informational line um, relative to the complexity of the communication. So um, they want you to know that the corresponding CPT codes that you're listing in the informational section is not separately reimbursable, but used to identify and track. Um, for the Medi-Cal fee-for-service rate when billing with the HCPCS code G0071, you should only list the G0071 in the payable claim line and do not include a corresponding CPT code. For Medi-Cal managed care, um, you guys will receive your PPS rate as applicable for rendering a Medi-Cal covered benefit or service, whether you're providing it through telehealth or telephone, um, as long as you meet all of the criteria and guidance and DHCS will ensure that you guys are made whole with a RAT payment. So in that same document, DHCS has included um, a whole lot of FAQs, um, and I, I wanted to put some of these in here that I felt were the most important um, and, the, and different from some of the things that we've um, traditionally heard of. So can physicians and healthcare practitioners and an FQHC provide covered services via virtual and telephonic communication and receive a fee-for-service rate for HCPCS code G0071? 
The answer is yes. Are registered nurses or licensed vocational nurses able to provide Medi-Cal benefits or services um, via virtual or telephonic communications and bill a fee-for-service rate? The answer is no. Medi-Cal has not changed its policies on billable providers or practitioners. Do FQs um, and RHCs bill covered telehealth services uh, the same as if it was in person? The answer is yes. Um, and then if you participate in any specialty mental health services, uh, for example, those that are contracted with um, mental health plans and the drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system, where can you find more information? Um, DHCS um, has put out a behavioral health information notice um, and an FAQ that we've linked you to on the site. Um, informed consent, so traditionally healthcare providers must inform the patient about the use of telehealth and obtain verbal or written consent from the patient for the use of telehealth. However, on April 3rd, our governor issued California Executive Order N4320, uh, which temporarily waived the telehealth consent requirement um, during the public health emergency. So for Medi-Cal, you are not required to obtain consent for the remainder of the public health emergency. Documentation, this is taken directly from uh, DHCS's policies, um, and it's just to let you know that documentation for benefits or services delivered via telehealth should be exactly the same as for a comparable in-person service, um, but you do want to note that these were done either via um, live video um, or telephone. And what resources are available to you? So providers can email any questions to the Malik uh, to the Medi-Cal telehealth email address. Um, that's medi-cal underscore telehealth at dhcs.ca.gov. Um, DHCS also has a telehealth web page that you can visit. And then of course their COVID-19 resource page. Um, the Department of Managed Healthcare also has a COVID-19 resource page and I find quite a bit of the information that I'm looking for um, between these two pages. So, the CTRC puts out a telehealth reimbursement guide for California. Um, we update this uh, roughly twice a year. Um, the last update was done in April of 2020. However, it does not include, I'm sorry, not April, February of 2020. Um, it does not include the COVID-19 updates. Um, changes are being made so often that it would be almost impossible to update it. So what we've done instead is we have put a COVID-19 reimbursement update section on our reimbursement page. Um, so there you will find information from C CMS, DHCS, DMHC, webinars, fact sheets, all kinds of different things um, as long as it's related about reimbursement for COVID-19. And last but not least, let's talk about private payers and managed care. So all health plans right now should be reimbursing for telehealth and telephone during the public health emergency. The reimbursement rate should be equal to the rate for in-person services, meaning you shouldn't be paid less, you shouldn't be paid more. You should be paid exactly as you would for in-person. Modifiers could be different. Some health plans still use modifier 95 and some use GT. Um, Please the service could be 02 or they could ask you to use your normal, P, um, your normal POS. So the bottom line and the big takeaway here is to listen to your health plan. Even if they want you to bill in a way that you're not used to, um, very similar to DHCS's statement earlier about they know that you don't normally use CPT codes, but they're asking you to do it. Um, the same kind of applies here for your health plans. If they're asking you to bill in a way that you would not normally, just go ahead and do it. Listen to your health plan, get paid. <laughs> um, so the Department of Managed Health Care put out an APL on March 18th, um, and the biggest takeaway from this APL was that they, they wanted you to know, they wanted to um, order health plans, basically, to pay for telehealth and telephone services the same as they would in person, um, and they also wanted to um, make health plans aware that a health plan cannot subject members to cost sharing greater than the same cost sharing as if the service were provided in person. So that's the takeaway from the first APL. The second APL they put out was on April 7th, um, and I'm not gonna read everything on this slide, but the last paragraph is the most important, and that is that DMHC had heard from providers and from members that health plans were requiring their members to access services through the plan's contracted telehealth vendor, for example, Teladoc or Amwell or one of them, um, rather than the health plan covering telehealth services delivered by the provider who would have typically seen the patient in person. So during COVID-19, a health plan may not require members to use the plan's telehealth vendor 
or a different provider from the one that the member typically sees if the member's provider is willing to deliver the service to the member via telehealth and the member consents to receiving the service. So what does that mean for you guys? That means that if one of your members comes to you and says, or one of your patients comes to you and says, I want to see you via telehealth. Um, the plan, the health plan cannot say, no, I'm sorry, you can't do that because we only use Teladoc or we only use American Well. They can't do that for the remainder of the public health emergency. They do have to pay you for telehealth services as long as you are willing to see your patients in that manner and your patients consent to receiving that service in that manner. So that's all I have for you today. Um, I know that this is confusing. I know that it usually brings up just a ton of questions. So if you do have questions, please reach out to us. Um, we have a contact us form on our website that you can use or you can email me directly. Um, you can call, um, however, phone has been uh, quite crazy lately. So the quickest way to get in touch and get a response to your questions is either the contact us form on our website or my email address. Um, so thank you guys very much for uh, listening to me yak at you uh, for the last 30 minutes and stay safe and have a wonderful afternoon.